Again, Mark chapter 9, at verse 9 through to verse 13. Hear the word of the Lord. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning with one another, one with another, what the rising from the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, What say the scribes that Elias, why say the scribes that Elias must come first? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done whatsoever they listed, done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Before we get started, let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, this time to come before your word. Thank you for this time in which you've called us to worship you. And we pray now, Lord, that by your spirit, your word would be preached to the glory of your name and the edification of your saints, the salvation of the lost, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, welcome. My name is Sean. I'm uh, the pastor here. Uh, pleasure to have you. We're working through the gospel according to Mark right now. And so we're, we come to Mark chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. Uh, both last week and this week, have not. they haven't been a break from Mark anywhere. We're still working our way through the text. Uh, but we've been kind of taking big chunks of narrative. And these last two weeks have taken shorter uh, chunks because there's uh, big theological uh, items to unpack. Last week we looked at the transfiguration, something that's often kind of breezed over, and so we sought to understand that better by looking at Second Peter uh, chapter 1, where Peter talks about the transfiguration and gives us insight as to what's being communicated by Jesus in uh, the transfiguration. This week, similar dynamic, uh, we obviously have a text and a purpose of that text, uh, the main purpose where we're going, right? Jesus, for the last two chapters, has really been very plainly declaring to the disciples, I must suffer and die. I must suffer and die, and I will rise again. And at this point, the disciples are pretty blind to that reality. Right? That, hasn't, that hasn't hit home for them yet. Right? Peter's tried to rebuke Jesus for even saying such words, which obviously Jesus uh, brings that rebuke right back on Peter. Uh, we've seen that very plainly in our text. But this week we have uh, a reference you heard Lance read from Malachi chapter 4 for our Old Testament reading this morning. Uh, and that text is certainly being referenced this morning, but not necessarily how it's often uh, taken to be referenced. Uh, Jesus is giving us an insight into how we ought to interpret the Bible, uh, and, and so we'll look at that this morning. So, main purpose of the text, Jesus is still driving at the idea that he must suffer and die, so we don't, we don't want to lose sight of that, that's where we're going to end this morning. Uh, but in the middle of that, we need to understand, how is Jesus, this is the question I want to answer, how is Jesus uh, talking about, or he's comparing John the Baptist and Elijah in our text, but he's saying that there's something written, which is a reference to the Old Testament, there's something written that's supposed to give us insight into the fact that John the Baptist would need to suffer. And that's not really the thrust of the Malachi prophecy, and so we'll have to understand where that's coming from. So that's the goal this morning. Now, from the days of the early church until now, the relationship between the Old and New Testament has been a hotly debated topic. Right? Theologians down through the ages have presented different methods for going about the work of understanding how to relate these things properly, especially in light of the work of Christ. Some have advocated for a strictly literal understanding of the text of the Bible and therefore would deny any figurative or spiritual fulfillment of a prophecy in the Old Testament. And this limits what we talked about last week with typology, right? Pictures in the Old Testament that are meant to be fulfilled in the New Testament, right? Pictures of Christ fulfilled in the New Testament. This was not only a problem in the early church with groups like the Marcionites, right? Those who would say that the God of the Old Testament was actually evil and that the God of the New Testament was good, right? Those are, that's a heretical group, the Marcionites. But it's also presented itself as an error in our eight day and age with dispensationalists to different degrees. While Marcion was a heretic divorcing the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New, the dispensationalists consider it their divorce to be one between uh, which people are being spoken about in the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament, classical dispensationalists would say the Old Testament is a book for the Jews, the New Testament is a book for Christians. All right, and that, that will come back into relevance for them in the millennial reign of Christ. That's how they would see uh, the relevance of the Old Testament. All right, they do not assert that the Old and New Testament present different gods, but that they represent different books for different peoples. And so everything in the Old Testament has a literal fulfillment. It can't have a second fulfillment in the New Testament or any kind of spiritual figurative fulfillment. In other words, you know, the, way, the way they would understand a prophecy about Elijah must be literally about Elijah. 
Right? That would be a literal fulfillment of that prophecy. And it cannot be otherwise in their view. This literal fulfillment, which is also the interpretive method of the Jews themselves, right? that's how the Jews would interpret the Old Testament scriptures, there must be a literal fulfillment, has a counter on the other end of the spectrum, which also has a rich history in the early church, and that's allegorical interpretation. So on one end you have very literal, strict literalism in your interpretation. On the other end you have uh, allegorical interpretation. Now this started, this had roots in Greek tradition. Uh, it really became popular because Homer was uh, very revered in Greek, in Greek history, in Greek culture. And then as uh, science progressed and Homer's works started to get outdated, and some became kind of an embarrassment. Oh, Homer said that. Science has kind of proven that's a, a foolish way to, to phrase that or a foolish way to understand that. And so they said, well, really, it's not the words. We shouldn't be looking at the exact words that Homer's saying. It's what was he trying to communicate there? There's a meaning that can actually be derived by reading those words. And that's the allegorical interpretation. It's this deeper spiritual meaning. You really have to get it. You really have to understand Homer to be able to see this picture that's being painted, even though the words aren't the thing painting it. Which, obviously, you can see the problems with that because it kind of gives you license to do whatever the heck you want. You can do whatever you want with something like that. And that actually influenced the early church who saw credibility to some of the things Marcion was saying, uh, of saying, you know, you have Origen saying things like, you know, who did many great things for the church, but saying things that there are, there are texts in the Old Testament that are, quote-unquote, unworthy of God. Oh, well, God wouldn't do that. That's unworthy of God. And so the only way to understand that, we're not going to reject the God of the Old Testament, but we're going to understand these texts allegorically. Or there's something beneath the text, something deeper, something much richer than words could ever communicate. And obviously you have to have some kind of secret knowledge to be able to attain that. How do you, how do you refute someone who goes to, to those depths if you can't appeal to the word? But if you can't appeal back to the word, then you're kind of you're kind of out of luck in that situation. And so this led men like Origen and Clement of Alexandria to adopt a hermeneutic again of allegorical interpretation. And as an example of some of the the folly that this can lead into, uh, one of the things they would do they went to is uh, so they talked about uh, Abraham with Sarah and Hagar, and the way they understood that text allegorically, of course, you have to have a deep a deep spiritual understanding of the things of God to come to this. But what they, would, they said that then, especially Clement of Alexandria, was that uh, Sarah represented biblical wisdom. Hagar represented human philosophy. And really, you need to understand, this is a, it's a defense really for classical Christian education. You need to understand uh, the things of human philosophy before you really dedicate yourself to the study of divinity. And that's why Abraham didn't have uh, fruitful sex with Sarah until he slept with Hagar. He needed that human philosophy before he could go and get this uh, divine wisdom with Sarah. right? And obviously, that's nowhere found in the scriptures. You cannot make a defense of that from the Bible. But if you allow for allegorical interpretation... Why not? Right? It's deeper. It's a deeper spiritual meaning. You're going to tell me I'm wrong? I have a great prayer life. <laughs> I have a great time with God. Right? So that can't be the standard. That's the, that's the polar opposite to that literal interpretation, and that cannot be our standard. Right? Because from the outset, allegorical interpretation does not claim to have its feet planted in the written words of Scripture. But both of these extremes of hermeneutical style wind up coming into conflict with much of what the Bible teaches as the way to interpret the Bible. And among such corrective texts, texts that help to bring us to how, the, how Jesus would have us interpret the Bible, uh, among those texts is ours this morning. One of the things recovered in the Reformation was a historical, grammatical interpretation of the Bible. This is a style of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a way of how do we go about interpreting the Bible? How do we understand what it says? How do we reconcile uh, passages that seem to be in conflict? This is a style of hermeneutics which recognizes that words have objective meaning. You guys came to hear me speak this morning because you, have a, you place a high value on words. Like, I can speak things, you can understand them, they have a meaning. And therefore, the grammar of each particular passage of the Bible is important. Because God cho chose to communicate to us in words. It's good enough for God to communicate this. He's, he's not a God of confusion. He's communicating clearly to us, and he's done it through words. Understanding what the word means, first of all, we must assert is possible. That is something we can do. It has an objective meaning. And these words are how God reveals himself to us. Therefore, it's necessary for us that we properly understand these words, and we do so in their context. Right? That context includes not only the words themselves, but the time in which they were used. Right? Words take on different meanings in different seasons uh, of the world, and so we need to understand how it was being used in that time. Right, the surrounding culture, the historical setting, the style of the book being written, 
Right? You can't interpret poetry the same way you interpret a historical recounting of an event and many other factors. All of this plays into how we properly understand any given text of the Bible. On top of this, and this is where we lose some of the strict literalists who'd be tracking up to this point, the Bible speaks typologically. The Bible speaks in types and shadows, right? It's a story. It's one cohesive story. It's not, the Bible's not just all these books put spliced together that don't have cohesion. They all work together to tell a grand story of God's redemptive purposes in the world. And so we have shadows in the Old Testament that we see fulfilled in the new, namely in Jesus Christ, right? You see that in the temple, right? Jesus is the fulfillment of those sacrificial offerings, but that's not a, that's not a literal thing, right? You don't see Jesus isn't a literal lamb. And yet he is the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world. Right? So we, we have to be able to speak in types, shadows, figures, and not be uh, so strictly literal that we lose what's being communicated clearly in the Bible. In other words, sometimes interpreting literally would be completely to neglect the context in which a particular prophecy is given. Or if you want to interpret poetry literally, you can easily miss what's being communicated uh, in that in that information, in those words. And so we must interpret the Bible in a way that recognizes objective meaning, the objective meaning of the text, but not in such a way that we refuse to see the overall tapestry created by the biblical narrative. And so again, our text this morning will help us to see a specific example of how this hermeneutic is to be applied, taking heed to that which has been written. And that's always who we want to be as Christians, taking heed to that which is written. Otherwise, we're just like the allegorical interpreters. Right? No grounding, no area in which we can be corrected, no area in which we can be truly uh, exhorted to the truth, uh, encouraged in the truth if we do not have the word. So the idea of the, of the Old Testament being a Jewish book, as the dispensationalists assert, is a foolish one, and one that Jesus continues, continually thwarts in his own ministry uh, by showing that the Old Testament clearly pointed to him. Right? And a perfect example of that is in John chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. Jesus says, and ye have not his word, he's speaking to the Pharisees, ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, right, Jesus speaking of himself, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, Jesus tells them. And right, he's referring to the Old Testament, that's what they have at this point, as Jesus is ministering to them. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Right, go to the Old Testament, and you're going to see me everywhere. That's what Jesus is saying here. Go to the Old Testament and I'm everywhere. It testifies of me. It's all pointing forward to me. I'm the point of the whole thing. And so the Old Testament is a book for Christians to call their own. It's a book that testifies of Jesus Christ. I mean, think about the way the New Testament speaks of, of those who were not a part of Israel. Right? This, again, points us to the reality that the Old Testament is our book. The, the heritage of faithful Jews is our heritage. Right? Even Gentiles who were at one time aliens, Paul says are now the children of God. And as children of God, they share in the lineage of Old Testament saints. We're not to understand ourselves as disjointed, disjointed from God's people prior to Christ. And Paul makes that clear for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read, there's a section here where he's uh, going to appeal to multiple Old Testament stories, 1 Corinthians 10. In verse 1, he starts by speaking to the Corinthians. Remember, Gentiles, Gentiles in Corinth. He says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers, all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. That's verse 1. And then down in verse 11, he says, now all these things, right? He recounts these events where God was uh, with the people of Israel in, uh, with Moses, right? Passing through the Red Sea and then in the wilderness. And he says, these are your fathers. These aren't Jews. Why are they their fathers? Well, it's the faithful, right? The people of God down through the ages. And so in verse 11, he closes that section by saying, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. Should Christians be reading the Old Testament? Well, these things were written down for our admonition. We're supposed to grow by looking at them and looking at how they interacted with God, seeing their faithlessness at times, and learning to not imitate that, seeing their faithfulness at times, learning to imitate that. And so these things were written uh, unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition on, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So Paul, again, speaking here to Gentiles, says that those in the Old Testament who were with Moses passing through the Red Sea and who were led by God in the wilderness were our fathers. They are part of our heritage, even though we are Gentiles. And what happened to them was not written for the Jews only, but for us as well, for all God's people. 
The Old Testament is far from a disjointed recounting of the history of God's dealing with the Jews. It's the story of our fathers in the faith, full of words meant for our admonition, full of keys for understanding the story of redemption and its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Again, we'll see how our text teaches, uh, text teaches us to apply such truths. I promise we're getting to our text. Uh, and how to read and understand our Bibles. So the first portion of Mark 9 that we looked at last week, verses 1 through 8, in conjunction with 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter 1, verses 16 through 21, recounted for us the transfiguration of Christ. That's our context. This has just taken place on the high mountain with the three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. And we worked through both these te- texts last week in order to understand, to gain a fuller understanding of uh, what's being communicated to us in the transfiguration. And though I mentioned verse 9 last week, right, that's the verse we closed with last week, uh, we're going to pick up again with uh, Mark 9, 9 in this section of Mark's gospel account uh, as these uh, three close disciples, three closest disciples, descend the mountain with Jesus. So we're coming out of the transfiguration and we're descending the mountain here uh, and, and Jesus is with these three disciples. So we're getting verses 9 and 10, so it's fresh. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising of the dead should mean. So Jesus, again, uh, has commanded silence. This isn't the first time he's done this. This is actually Mark's, uh, Mark's, Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel account is full of Jesus uh, commanding silence upon uh, miracles or when uh, Peter, for, or, for example, confesses Jesus as the Christ. Jesus has commanded silence uh, in light of these confessions, in light of the witnessing or the experiencing of great miracles. The command here, and we've talked about this as they've come up again and again, so I won't harp on it here. But the command here is for the same reason that Jesus gave gave the command last time, which is that the disciples do not understand yet the nature of Christ's work and therefore are in no position to be spreading this message abroad. Right After Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, he also thinks it's appropriate to rebuke Jesus when Jesus says that he needs to suffer, die, and rise again. Right, They don't see that their fundamental problem is their sin and that they need a substitute for their sins and one who could uh, rise from the dead, def- defeating sin, death, and the devil in their place, which they could never do themselves. Right? They don't see that yet. They want a conquering Messiah who's going to bring some type of military victory, immediate ascendancy to the throne, at which maybe they consider their, his right and left hand. Right? They're still thinking like that. And so what business do they have going out to preach a quote-unquote gospel that is not a saving gospel? And so Jesus is commanding silence. Jesus said they're not to tell specifically here of his transfiguration until Jesus himself had risen from the dead. The disciples, as I mentioned last week, obey this command, right? They don't go around talking about the transfiguration. But verse 10 tells us that they're doing so not simply out of some, uh, you know, resolute obedience, understanding everything, really seeing it, but just uh, holding off because Jesus has told them to, but they're really confused. There's a confusion amongst the disciples. They did not know what to make of Jesus' statement regarding his rising from the dead. That's what verse 10 tells us. Now remember, right? that idea in and of itself is not complete, uh, completely out of left field for the disciples. They're not among the Sadducees. We know that the Sadducees, right? Paul's going to use that later very tactfully in Acts to stir up division amongst those who want to persecute him by saying, well, it's, it's for the, the, rise, the, the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial, right? And that's, that stirs stuff up because there's people who already believe in that and there's people who don't believe in that. But all of them have that category at the end of times. Right? All of them have that as, you know, at the end of everything, the dead will rise, the just and the unjust, and God will judge all men. The faithful have that category. The disciples here have that category, just like the Pharisees do. They're not amongst the Sadducees. So just the idea, the broad idea of resurrection is not outlandish to them. But what Jesus is saying here makes no sense to them, that Jesus would have to die himself and rise from the dead. They don't have that category. They have resurrection at the end of all times, at the end of all things, but not this category. And remember from Mark 8 that Jesus told them very plainly that he needed to suffer, he needed to die, and that he would rise from the dead. But they do not have a category yet for a dying Savior. That's that's an oxymoron to them at this point, right? We know that that is our only chance, our only hope for salvation. We need one to die in our place. The wages of sin is death. Right, I've been keenly reminded of that. I'm going to go home to a lot of militant atheists for this funeral. Right? But there's, and there's going to be all kinds of sugarcoating of what death is about. Death is really beautiful. Death is not beautiful. Death is horrible. Death is horrendous. The wages of sin is death. 
If Adam didn't sin, there would be no death. That's why there's death in the world. And so we know that's the only category for life. We need one to die in our place. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, right? Finish the verse. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so through Jesus, we can have that salvation, but that's because he died. Not because he just ascended to the throne and he said, I can just forgive you all, right? It's like, like the Muslims, right? They just worship our God and you can be forgiven your sins. Well, what about a substitute? What about one to die in my place and rise from the dead? Because I owe death. I've sinned. I owe death. So that needs to be taken care of first and foremost. We can't move on until we have that. Right? The disciples do not have a category for a dying Savior. No way to conceive of this shepherd king that we talked about a few weeks ago. Right? This great shepherd king who feeds his people miraculously in the wilderness. No category for him dying, suffering, being crucified. We've talked in Mark's gospel account about the difference between evidence and faith. The difference between evidence and faith. And a similar dynamic can be noticed here. Right, we don't want to, we're not against evidence. We don't, we're not against showing people the realities in the world that prove that God is who he is. But we also know that that does not uh, establish faith. God must work faith uh, into, uh, into the sinful heart if they are to have it. Right? People are not in need of hearing the right sequence of words, even when we go out to preach the gospel. Right? There's a difference between an insufficient gospel and a sufficient gospel. But that salvation doesn't rest in your perfect articulation of a perfect gospel proclamation. Right? That's not what it comes down to because it's the sovereignty of God in salvation. Right? They need ears to hear the truth, eyes to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You can give the perfect gospel proclamation, perfect presentation of the gospel in your evangelism, and if the Spirit of God does not graciously act in the heart and mind of the hearer, then the unbeliever will not hear. And this, God forbid, this is not cause for us to throw up our hands in frustration and abandon such work. For that is to claim an understanding of God's sovereignty and salvation while simultaneously neglecting the means by which he has explicitly told us that he will save. Oh, well, God's sovereign, so why would I go out and evangelize? Um, maybe he said because how are they going to believe if they don't hear and how are they going to hear unless someone preaches to them? Blessed are the feet of those who bring the good news. We should believe that text too. God's sovereignty and opening blind eyes to see the glory of Christ should not minimize our evangelism, but it should increase our prayers going into evangelism. Don't go out thinking it's all about uh, the right articulation of the words as much as we want to study and be approved. But go out knowing that God's got to do this work. And so we better be prayerful in going into this work. We go to the work, but we go knowing that God must also work by his spirit if there's going to be any fruit. The disciples will eventually see by the grace of God but now they remain confused, even when plain words are given to them by Jesus. Right? Jesus isn't speaking in some crazy parable to the disciples. Look back at Mark 8, if you have a chance, if you don't remember that text when we went through it. Right? Jesus says, I'm going to suffer, die, and rise again. What could that mean? Right? It's not because it wasn't plain words. It's not like Jesus did not do a sufficient job of revealing this truth to them in terms of the words he's using. And yet they don't see He's not speaking in riddles, and yet the truth remains a dark mystery to the disciples. But as they're contemplating this dynamic, the disciples we see have a thought. They've correctly identified Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. Peter's done that as their representative. They've had this identification we saw amongst the things we saw uh, taught in the Transfiguration. One of them very clearly was the uh, authentication of uh, Peter's proclamation of Jesus as the Christ. Right, that's been confirmed greatly in uh, what really functions as a, almost a glorified baptism. Right, Whereas in baptism, he comes up out of the water and the dove descends. This time, Jesus has uh, the voice of the Father speaking to him as he's in this glory cloud representing the Spirit. Right? And the Father again says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. So that's been confirmed in the transfiguration. They've correctly identified him. And then we saw again that Elijah was present with Moses on this mountain. And the presence of Elijah appears to make uh, the... The disciples think of a word specifically from the scribes. And that we see in verse 11. They asked him saying, why say the scribes? So they're not even appealing to the Bible right here uh, alone. right? There's, there's a teaching of the scribes. We'll look at that here shortly. Why say the scribes that Elias must come first? Right, there's something unique being said by the scribes, but the appeal, what the scribes are appealing to and what the disciples are appealing to does come from Malachi. I'll read verses 5 and 6 of Malachi chapter 4 again so it's fresh. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming 
of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The scribes of this era, of Jesus' era, taught that Elijah was going to return in bodily form to minister before the day of the Lord. Remember, the Jews had this literal interpretation. Before the Messiah would come, Elijah would be ministering. It appeared to the disciples that this was indeed what was about to take place, right? We, now we have, we've identified Jesus as the Christ. He's the Messiah. This has been confirmed by the Father on this holy mountain. And Elijah's here. Surely Elijah's going to descend the mountain with us, begin this ministry of turning hearts. But Elijah was gone. Remember when the cloud goes away, it's just Jesus standing there. Right? Peter mistakenly wanted to build a tabernacle for all three, for Moses, for Elijah, and for Jesus. No, they're not on the same level. Jesus alone has the, the glory cloud around him. Jesus alone has the proclamation from the Father that this is his beloved Son, and that he must be listened to. And so they're not on the same page, and now Elijah is gone. If Elijah has departed before this work has been done, then what does this communicate about Jesus' ministry as the Messiah? Is this really the Messiah if Elijah is not going to come before him and start turning hearts, right? Father's hearts to their children, children's hearts to their fathers. Again, thinking literally, this prophecy could only be fulfilled by the literal Elijah, if that's the route we're taking. It's not, but if that's the route we're taking. But Jesus acknowledges the prophecy, agreeing that Elijah must come first, that's what Jesus does in our text, and explains that it has already been fulfilled. That's what we see in verses 12 and 13. And he answered and told them, Elias verily must come first. Elias is the same as Elijah. Verily, must, uh, verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you, verse 13, that Elias is indeed come and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. Jesus says that Elijah has come and has restored all things. But it was not literally Elijah who did this work of laying the foundation of repentance before the coming of Christ. Luke says it well in the prophecy that he gives to John the Baptist's parents in Luke 1.17 regarding uh, the nature of John's ministry, what John the Baptist would come to do. So this is Luke chapter 1, verse 17. So this is uh, the word from the angel that uh, John the Baptist's parents received regarding John's ministry. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of who? Elijah, of Elias, to turn their, the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So we have an explicit text in the New Testament that tells us John the Baptist was Elijah, not literally Elijah, but he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And therefore the ministry which Malachi said Elijah must perform before the day of the Lord was fulfilled in John. Although Mark's gospel leaves us to assume that the disciples are making this connection when Jesus says this, uh, Matthew's account makes it plain. So this is just verses 12 and 13 of Matthew 17. So the same account, Jesus has just told them, they've said, why do the scribes say this? Jesus responds, he says, but I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So the disciples put this together. Right? Mark doesn't tell us explicitly. Matthew tells us explicitly. The disciples put this together. They understand what Jesus is talking about here. Elijah is John the Baptist. Or John the Baptist is Elijah. So Elijah being John the Baptist is made clear. But there is more for us to understand in verses 12 and 13 here. So what we see Jesus doing, he's linking his work as the Son of Man with the work of John the Baptist. But there's a contrast in the picture that Jesus draws from that of Malachi's prophecy. How are we to understand that? Malachi's prophecy speaks, speaks of Elijah's ministry and leaves the reader, if you read Malachi plainly, leaves the reader anticipating at least a degree of warm reception for Elijah, for this Elijah figure. Right? He's going to be turning the hearts of children to their fathers, fathers to their children. You're like, sweet, this is going to be a beautiful, glorious day. Now, it can't be that guy that got beheaded by Herod after that young girl danced before him and pleased him and his wicked men. It can't be that guy. How does that add up? How does that add up? And that should be attention to us. We need to resolve that. But Jesus says in verse 12, before explaining further, that John the Baptist's work of restoration paralleled his own work. And that was the work of suffering and being despised. Right? That's what Jesus came to do, to suffer and be despised. Jesus says that this was not the product of the free choices of men 
apart from any plan. Rather, this was uh, this suffering would happen to the Son of Man, Jesus says, as it was written. As it was written. In other words, Jesus says that this was indeed the teaching of the Scriptures in verse 12. That's what it means when he says, as it was written. Scripture taught that the Son of Man would need to suffer. And so that's a rebuke to the disciples on one level because they should have known this. You've got your Old Testament. It testifies of me. You should have known that the Messiah was to suffer. Right? Where might Jesus be appealing to? Well, the words here are clearly a reference to Isaiah 53, and we'll return to this text shortly. But first, how does this picture of Christ's suffering fit with, with what was written of Elijah? Right? If that Malachi prophecy is, is prophesying what seems like, at least plainly, a warm reception for this Elijah figure, how are we to understand this? Verse 13 clearly tells us enough, uh, clearly enough tells us that John the Baptist came and suffered, right? That certainly is what happened to him. Again, right, in, ends his life in prison, and, to, and Herod doesn't want to kill him, right? Herod likes hearing a lot of things from John the Baptist, just doesn't like hearing that one word, which we know as we talked about in that text is the one word we need to preach to people when we know that one word that's going to be a, a stone in their shoe, something they can't shake. He says, you may not have your brother's wife. That was a text. There was many things the, te- the, the Bible says that Herod was willing to hear from John. Plenty of things he's willing to hear about the way of godliness, but not, you may not have that woman. So that's what John preached to him, because John was a faithful man. He knew that's what he needed to hear, because he needed to repent of that. If you're not willing to let that go, that's a problem. That's a fundamental problem. Herod never does let that go, as far as we see. But he does behead John the Baptist. He's kind of conned into doing so by Herodias, who we saw was a type of Jezebel, right, persecuting the people of God. But Jesus again appeals in verse 13 to the scriptures. He again says, as it is written. So there's something written that's supposed to help us connect this idea of John the Baptist being one who would come and suffer just like Jesus would. And this appeal, again, that, that's, the, that's what's uh, implied in this appeal. If this is not the case, then why does Jesus again apl- uh, appeal to the Old Testament with the phrase, as it is written? Right? If it isn't directly Malachi's prophecy, we must understand this prophecy for the suffering of John the Baptist elsewhere in the scriptures. We can't just make it up. Now, again, if you remember back to Herod's feast, I think this is the key to understanding this, which we looked at in Mark chapter 6, so it's been a few weeks, a few months probably. We saw parallels not only between Elijah and John, but the rulers of each of those men, uh, the rulers over each of those men in their ministries. So Elijah was dealing with Ahab and John the Baptist with Herod Antipas. In those parallels, we saw John dealing with another, another Ahab and another Jezebel. Right, that's who John was dealing with between Herod and Herodias. Right, Herodias is playing the role of Jezebel persecuting because she's the one. Right, she tells her daughter to her daughter Salome dances before King Herod. He says, "I'll give you anything up to half of my kingdom." She consults with her mom. Her mom tells us, "Well, give me the head of John the Baptist." Right, so she's she's functioning. Herodias is functioning as a parallel to Jezebel, who persecuted uh, the saints in the Old Testament in Elijah's day. And so, if you read through First Kings seventeen through twenty-one, I will encourage you to do so. We're not going to do that now. What you'll see is that John the Baptist would be the fulfillment of a man in Elijah who was a typological martyr. Right? Elijah would be faithful to the word, and that faithfulness to the word would put a target on his back. Right? And it was not just any target, but a target placed on him from the king's palace. Right? It came from Ahab, really from Jezebel, because Ahab's just being thrown around by Jezebel, doesn't have control of his home. And so it came from this command from the evil queen Jezebel. Not only did Jezebel kill the prophets of the Lord in general, Right, remembering back again to Mark 6, Obadiah had to hide a bunch of prophets of the Lord in a cave just to keep them from being slaughtered by Jezebel as she went on this tirade. But she made a specific threat on Elijah's life. In 1 Kings 19, after Elijah defeated and slayed the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. And so Elijah's faithfulness was leading to a threat on his life from the royal house. That was the result of Elijah's faithfulness. But Elijah would eventually escape. Right, leave this life in a chariot, unharmed ultimately by the vile and powerful threats of Jezebel, and able to have the glory of peace without the pain of death. That was Elijah's end. But remember, as we talked about last week, that the type is of a similar nature, but less glorious than the antitype. Right? Antitype is a reference to the fulfillment of a type. So if Elijah is a type of John the Baptist, John the Baptist would be, it's the same nature, right? They're both prophets of the Lord. They both suffer persecution because of their faithfulness. Elijah's going to escape. John the Baptist is not. 
Elijah was the type, and in different ways, both John the Baptist and Jesus are here the antitype, the fulfillment. Elijah was spared suffering at the hands of Ahab, but John the Baptist was not spared. As Jesus says, they did whatever they listed of him, whatever they wished of him, which was wicked. Elijah's ministry would be an ascendant one, they believed. Right? If Elijah planted a church before the coming of the day of the Lord, it would be packed to the gills. That's what it was going to look like when Elijah came. Families would be reconciled. The earth filled with peace. The way of the Lord prepared. Israel exalted in the earth. But Jesus says essentially that this is not what the Bible teaches. He says, as it is written, the one coming in the power and spirit of Elijah, John the Baptist, would suffer just like he would suffer as the Messiah. And that leaves us with the question of where again the Bible teaches this message. If it's not in the typology or the picture of Elijah's potential suffering at the hands of Ahab and Jezebel for his faithfulness to God's word, then we are left, as far as I can tell, and I'd love to talk about it. I unfortunately won't be here after church today, but I'd love to talk about it sometime, uh, without a response. We have no literal word to point to in the Old Testament to understand the suffering which Jesus said was prophesied in the Old Testament of John the Baptist. He says, this is how it was written. You should see this from the Old Testament. And this means that Jesus is here instructing us. Hopefully this ties in for you with my introduction. He's instructing us on how to read the Bible. We have to understand the story. It can't just be all systematic theology. That's not going to answer everything for us, as important as that is. We have to see poetic parallels. We have to be willing to draw these connections if we're to understand more of the fullness of what the Bible has for us. And by way of application, one practical way to acquaint yourself further with this reality of the the continuity of the Bible is to go through your New Testament and highlight every Old Testament reference. Look at the parallels. Read the Old Testament account being referenced. Don't just acknowledge a cross-reference there, but go read that account and vice versa. Find the connections and use those references to shed further light on the meaning of a particular passage. On top of this, we, of course, have to be regularly working through the entire Bible. We don't just read our New Testaments. We need to read our entire Bible and grow in our knowledge of its stories and its characters. Because sometimes those characters are foreshadowing characters in the future, and we're going to gain a greater understanding of that if we're reading it all. Now, in conclusion, notice the surety. Notice the surety with which Jesus speaks of the prophecies of the Bible. Right? He does not bat an eye when he says, as it is written. Right? That's a plain appeal to him, and sure as anything else. Surer than anything else, I should say. If something has been written in the scriptures, it will surely come to pass. That's Jesus' position here. As it is written, just basically means it's set in stone. If God has made a promise, it will be kept. If he has a prophetic word, it will be fulfilled. As God says himself in Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 11, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Not just seeing it, not just knowing it. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east. The man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will bring it to pass. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. We can have confidence in the word of God because God always fulfills his word. He's the sovereign Lord over all creation and over all of history. He didn't just make everything and step back. He's spoken it all, the end from the beginning. Nobody else is declaring the end from the beginning, only God. Nobody can override his counsels, none can thwart his promises. And though there are many promises in the scriptures to which we could appeal, those that bring the greatest confirmation and comfort to us are those pertaining to the promises of a Savior. Those promises that God would send a Messiah who would serve as a substitute for us, paying our penalty and reconciling us to himself. If God were to fulfill a promise like that, if that were on the table, then surely all reason for doubt would be eternally dispelled from the sound mind. But if God would do a work like that, if God would provide a substitute for sinners, fulfill that kind of word, surely there's no reason left for us to doubt his goodness, and the surety of his promises. Jesus is confidently standing on that which has been written, and we must do the same. 
Again, Jesus therefore tells his disciples of his plan to suffer and die straightforwardly as one who is firmly resolute. John the Baptist suffered at the hands of Herod and Jesus would suffer at the hands of the Pharisees and scribes, as we saw in Mark 8. When the disciples tried to present a rebuke at such a path for their Messiah, he met their temptation, and it was a temptation, and, a re and rebuke. He met their temptation and rebuke with a rebuke of his own. Because Jesus knew the scriptures and he believed the scriptures. The debates today over the nature of the Old Testament were not a concern for Christ. The words of our text make it clear that he would not have entertained any debate over who was being referenced in Isaiah 53. Jesus knew that it was written of him. And in conclusion, we'll go there now. Isaiah 53, verses 2 through 6. Pay specific attention to verse 3. That's what's quoted by Jesus and what, what Jesus is referring to in our text. Isaiah 53, at verse 2. Hundreds of years before the Messiah. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Specifically in verse 3, we read that the suffering servant, right? This section of Isaiah is known as the suffering servant passages. We read that the suffering servant would be despised and rejected of men. The same language used in our text by Jesus. Elijah, as the type, was able to avoid suffering unto death. But Jesus, a far greater fulfillment of Elijah than even John the Baptist was, would not dodge death. As it was written, he could not avoid the suffering that awaited him. Such chastisement was the only way for us to have peace. Such brutal, painful, shameful stripes were the only way for us to be healed. We needed one to take our iniquity on himself, and the Lord graciously laid it all on Christ. This, the most glorious news in the world, and it is the most glorious news in all the world, was crushing the disciples at this point. They hated it. They did not understand how a dead Messiah was good news. But this is because they did not understand Jesus' words to them, that he would not only die, but rise from the dead. The disciples did not understand what had been written. They did not understand what had been written. Though it would soon be the heartbeat of all that they preached, as it was for the Apostle Paul, when he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The same appeal, according to the Scriptures. Could have said as it was written. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures. Christ is our Savior who has died for our sins and rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. He rose, and so we are justified before the Father. He rose for our justification. We are forgiven, we are cleansed, we are reconciled to God through faith in Jesus. And that's the only way to have this reconciliation. Right? Sinners before the Holy God was, must recognize that there's no hope for them to have forgiveness apart from the grace of God in Jesus Christ. God has fulfilled this promise. God has fulfilled this promise. Jesus is now seated in heaven at his right hand as a constant testimony to the faithfulness of God to fulfill his word. Right? Do you doubt the promises? Look to Jesus. Look to the right hand of the Father and see Jesus enthroned. Behold Christ and never doubt a single promise from the one who sent him. This message, which was hopeless for the disciples at the time, so they thought, would soon be the cause for ceaseless praise. And may that mark our lives. Not only praise here and now, but praise for eternity. As it is written in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength, and honor and glory and blessing. And amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for your precious promises to us. We thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ, who indeed suffered in our place, died, 
in our place after living a perfect life of righteousness, fulfilling the law that we failed to obey before you, Lord. We thank you that we can have life in his name because he not only died but rose from the dead. And we pray that you'd make us a people, uh, praising you for your wondrous works to the children of men. We love you, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.